Welcome to On Health with Houston Methodist. I'm Zach Moore. I'm a photographer and editor here, and I'm also a longtime podcaster. I'm Katie McCallum. I'm a former researcher turned health writer, mostly writing for our blogs. I'm Todd Ackerman. I'm a former medical reporter, currently an editor at Houston Methodist. I'm Kim Rivera Houston Weber, and I'm a copywriter here at Houston Methodist. And Todd, what are you afraid of? Well, generally, I would not describe myself as a particularly brave person. But if we're talking about specific things, I definitely uh, still have something. I have a fear of heights. Okay. And uh, uh, enclosed places. I'm kind of claustrophobic. Okay. Any more? That was well, there's two probably, already right off the top. Yeah, so. there's probably lots, but let's just stay with the conventional. <laughs> so don't sort take of him up higher. Don't put him in an enclosed space. Yes. So, what about you, Katie? I have a pretty stereotypical fear. I am afraid of the dark. Even as a grown adult, I'm still a little afraid of the dark. Uh, if I have to stay at my house by myself, mm. I do get a little spooked. I, I have to be honest. Is, is it your imagination? Yeah. Like what's in those shadows out there? Right? Yeah. It's that primal. I, yeah, I have a really active imagination okay. and it does not take much to set it off and send it down a path, um, that is afraid of most things. <laughs> and mm. the dark is a very easy one, right? Cause I can't see anything. So yeah. I don't know what's around me and I don't know, is someone going to jump out from behind the corner? My cats are coming in the bedroom in the dark and I'm like, Whoa, what's that movement? Like, I don't know. It just, I've, I've been like this since I was a kid. Does it help you to have pets though? Because if you hear a weird sound, you can say, Oh, it was the cats, right? Because if, if you know there's nothing else in your house yeah. and you hear noises, that would but, be more of a alarm. But do me. you know there's nothing else in your house? So that, okay. Yeah, now see, here we go. Fair <laughs> this <enough>. is the <laughs> Kim, Kim, what are you afraid of? I don't want to make it sound like I'm some brave person, but I struggle a little bit to think of what I'm afraid of. But I, when I was younger, I definitely was afraid of spiders. But I think that had more to do that my dad had this bad habit of taking me to age inappropriate movies. So I think I saw arachnophobia when it came out in the theaters and I should not have seen that movie. (laughs) I think I stayed with my grandparents that night and my grandma called and kind of chewed out my dad for taking me to the movie because she's sitting over here and she's scared to death. And what am I going (laughs) to do? I'm trying to sleep. You're, you're impressionable. As a child, right? Yeah. So that stuff can scar you for life. Yeah. Oh, are you still, so you're, and you're still afraid to them, of them to this day? Um, I would say I'm less, although the bugs y'all have down here in Texas are really, truly terrifying. All so maybe it down d- here in Texas. Like, that's I was right. going to say, I don't see a lot of spiders. We do get some weird cockroaches. Well, yeah. Why? So that's my greatest fear. Is okay. I was going to approach Yeah. I mean, the I. Fun. I'm not as afraid of them as I probably used to be. I just, they look gross. They fly at you. The flying ones are the worst. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've screamed yeah, when they fly. When well, you don't want to scream because they could fly in your mouth. Right? <laughs> so, oh, my gosh. <laughs> these are the th- this is where your mind goes, right? Yeah. No, I, I just, I can't stand roaches. And it's like, I'm, I'm, and it's part of me is like, you know, there's a bug in your house. Like, I don't want to like smash it because it's kind of gross. You have to it's, clean up the carpet. And it's mean. And it's like, yeah. you killed something. Yeah. So, so that I, I just... Put, take a cup and put it upside down and let them suffocate, which is kind of sadistic in its own way. Because like this is supposed to say you don't just put it outside. Well, <laughs> I thought you were going to yeah. say, "Oh, I take it outside." Well, yeah. if I can, but sometimes they're just they're okay. Just, they're, they're giant roach. I mean, you can't, yeah, you, you get my meaning. So that, that's what I'm most afraid of. Is it because they can like last forever? Like through an apocalypse, the roaches are going to be there. Or, like, what's the the fear of the roach? They just look gross. Yeah, like that's fair. and they're disease carrying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. cool. New fear unlocked. Thank yeah, you, sure. Todd. <laughs> Would you say you're hardened to to a lot of fears because your dad brought you to so many of these that mm. it's now sort of a can you top nothing? Mm. What can scare me now, given what I've all I've seen? <laughs> My parents were really big on like maybe they were big on exposure therapy and I just didn't know it. <laughs> but I, I feel like I, I did a lot of certain things really younger than than other folks. And um, my dad was a pilot. So. If I had a fear of heights, that was over very quickly. I don't have a fear of heights flying. It's just like if I'm on a tall building and a go out on the balcony and there's not much of a railing there, that will freak me out. See, I like to go to the... To the right, right up to the rail. Go to the edge. Yeah, yeah go to the edge and, and look down and be like, oh, it's what a beautiful view. It, it, it very That very much scares my husband. But Yeah, and I don't the fear of flying... I mean, the, the height factor as well, but it's more like the enclosed space. Like, I would think you would be terrified of an airplane. Say, you're yeah. afraid of heights. You're afraid of uh, of enclosed spaces, but you're like, ah, oh, airplanes, no problem. Like, that's the definition of an airplane. <laughs> I had the same exact thought. I was like, what? This doesn't make any sense, but I didn't want to scare you. <laughs> height, 
as I just pointed out, I don't think it's is it, it's a different phenomenon. So uh, that doesn't affect the. I can get a little claustrophobic in planes. I can remember one time where it was absolutely packed and there were very small seats, and I was in the like back in the corner. And I actually felt like I was starting to have a panic attack before I just closed my eyes and went to my wow. happy place. Okay. And it passed. But for a moment there, it was kind of scary to me. All right. All right. I feel like I bared my soul here. I think Good. we all have. Yeah. yeah. Good. So now, now we all know our greatest fear. So let's, let's trust each other not to use it against us. <laughs> uh, so Todd, who did we talk to today about the science of fear, which is the subject of today's podcast? We talked to Dr. Philip Horner, a neuroscientist at Houston Methodist, who is keenly interested in, in all things scary and is, stopped short of calling himself a fear junkie, but um, has a definite enjoyment of the genre. So we're here today with Dr. Phil Horner, a neuroscientist at Houston Methodist. Welcome, Dr. Horner. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Happy Halloween. Thank you. It's my favorite holiday. Your favorite holiday, really? It is. I, well, on my birthday is right I'm almost a Halloween baby, I guess, to say that that's the case. So we always had my birthday and Halloween were kind of an intermingled event together. So so let's talk a little bit of Halloween, a holiday dedicated to all things scary, yeah. beloved by kids who were otherwise in, seen kind of ruled by fears in their life. It's huge now with, with adults, um, Halloween parties and the lawn ornaments these days, I think, rival Christmas. Yeah. Um, so what's that all tapping into? I think... Halloween is one of the few holidays that is supposed to be pure fun, right? And I think there's something special about that. And, and you know, I don't know, classically, maybe there's something about the experience of fear that is a social thing, right? So when we experience anything that's scary, when we do it as a social thing, it feels kind of good. It's kind of a bonding thing. So I think there's something around that as well, um, facing what we're a little bit afraid of, but it's all tongue in cheek. It's in fun, right? When you think of Halloween as a holiday, we don't think of it as we were actually trying to scare the kids per se. You're in some way just pretending to be something you're not, or you're expressing yourself in a completely uni unique way. Although those home setups often have things jump out at you. Yeah. Right? Um, but those are kind of minor shocks that even a kid can appreciate. Right. But so there, but, and then that's fun because being a little bit scared, especially in a social circumstance when you know you're safe, is fun, right? That 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 it's um, that's a, a a so maybe it's fun in in one way in that um, you know you're safe. So there is this you get some of that sensation of being scared, and kids like that as long as they know they're safe. And then, but you also have this sense of you have faced something that was scary. So you can confidently face <laughs> that scary thing. I think it's an interesting holiday in that it represents, you know, many things to many different people. But, you know, in, in context of our discussion today, you know, the haunted house is a, is a big, you know, component of Halloween, right? So haunted houses have become extremely elaborate. And so why do people want to have that experience? You want to, you know, ask yourself why, why would you go somewhere where the, the job you're paying a group of people to scare you, right? And people like that, I think, and, and they like that experience. First, I mentioned the social aspect. There's something about facing something exciting like that socially. Um, the other aspect is, I think, if it's real enough to get that sensation of being scared, but not too too real, you it is a pleasurable experience because I think the experience of fear and of pleasure are not, you know, the circuitry there is not too different, right? So you can, people want that experience where they know they're safe, but they get some of that, some of the physiology or the, you know, the physical aspects of being afraid, which can feel good. One contemporary Halloween tradition is, is certainly horror movies. Why are they so popular, do you think? I think it's, I think it's similar. I don't want to, you know, I think you go to a horror movie and that's another example of it's a, it is a, I think a social thing. You're going with a crowd of people, um, even if you don't know them and not always. So sometimes people just watch them at home by themselves. Well, they do. Okay. And then that might be a different, that might be a different level 
of wanting to be afraid. So when you do it in a social situation, and I, I don't mean that you have to even be going with people, uh, you know, you might go to a crowded theater and you're going to feel safer in a crowded theater, right? Uh, and, and part of the, I guess, the emotional side of fear is you uh, are looking at how other people are responding to to a scary situation. So there's something about safety in numbers, right? So if you go to a scary movie and you're in a crowded theater, you might be seeing something that's really scary to you, but your brain, you know, can kind of um, rationalize that fear and sort of tamp down some of the real negative aspects of fear, right? Because you're in this, you're in the, a, a, an environment where there's a whole bunch of other people that are dealing with it. So we're very social animals in that regard. So let's go back to, let's go to your, your more extreme state. So I, I'm at home alone and I pick out, you know, a scary movie to watch. <laughs> and, uh, I was trying, I've done that myself once, only once it was during a thunderstorm. I remember doing that and, uh, I'm just forgetting the name you of the movie. You're like, let's go with it. We already got a thunderstorm. Let's, yeah. Yeah. Let's, it was like, so it, away. <laughs> silence of the lambs. So I, I picked silence of the lambs to watch alone <laughs> in a thunderstorm. <laughs> And I remember about halfway through that asking, questioning why I had done yeah. that because it definitely, you know, got very creepy, right? It was very, very scary. So, but I think when you, when you do that on your own, then you're, you're also tapping into this, there's a pleasure of, you know, really doing something, facing a fear on your own, right? You're really demonstrating to yourself uh, that you can face that fear, right? So you have that scary experience, but you're able to deal with it. So that's a good experience. Because if you go over the edge, if it becomes too real for you, you won't be doing that again, right? And that's why, you know, some people love horror movies, some people uh, don't, right? Um, and it's really, I think, about the balance of how much it affects you, um, you know, physiologically, right? And whether it becomes too real. And what I mean too real, so when we have when, when it starts to invade your way of thinking, you develop a level of anxiety inside you, it starts to become real, you're going to have all the, you know, biologic responses that you don't want. <laughs> and those are, you know, very stressful. It's a heightened level of stress. And that can be lasting too, right? So I think you, when you're home alone and you're watching a movie, that's a lot of fun for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's very distracting, Right. You're not going to if it's a good horror movie, you're not thinking about, you know, whether you have trouble at work or whatever, you know, what other issues you might be dealing with in your life. Those don't enter your brain. So you're getting this great distractions. So you're totally, you know, you're completely focused on something different. So that's also healthy biologically many times. Right. And it's a everybody wants a good distraction. Um, and then you're getting exposed to something that you don't know what's going to happen. So you're testing your ability to deal with something that's frightening. And it's really a test of your ability to kind of mentally determine that you're still safe, <laughs> but get enough of that uh, reaction to this horrifying, <laughs> you know, event that you're watching. You're getting that, you're getting partial exposure to that, par partial exposure and partial activation of that experience, that physiological experience. You're getting part of it just enough that it feels good. It feels good because your brain has told you you're safe and that you get some of that excitement feeling, but you it doesn't kind of creep into something bad. A lot of that is at a sort of subconscious level that you're not really thinking all these things when you're when you're watching. No. Yeah, you don't I don't think anybody overthinks that. They think yeah. I want a distraction maybe right. and I want to have some fun yeah, usually. Yeah. I just think in general there is a great you know, you know, there's a quote it's like why does someone bang their head in the wall? And they say, well, it is because it feels great when I quit. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's something about that fear, you know, when you're watching something like that that it isn't it isn't comfortable, right? I mean, it's not if it was if it was comfortable then you're not scared. Okay. So, but there's something about driving that fear circuit, but you, you still have this, you know, as you said, innate sense that you're safe, but you drive, you're driving that fear and it doesn't feel good. Of course, it doesn't feel good. Otherwise it wouldn't be fear. But when it's over, there's something good about that. It feels good to have that removal of that stimulus. Why do some people frighten easily and, and others don't? Or is that it just a matter of tapping into what seemingly stoic types are actually frightened of? Yeah. One simple answer would be if someone 
know something, you know, feels really comfortable knowing something isn't real. They may just be very critical and they can't let their mind believe something is real enough, right, to be scared of something. So maybe someone who's very analytical or maybe an engineer or something who knows the structure of something too well and doesn't believe it's dangerous, you know, at the amusement park or something. That's <laughs> a good example, right? But also, you know, people have wide variety of fears, right? So people, there are people who aren't afraid. They go to a horror movie. They're not afraid at all of that. Um, but maybe they're terrified of flying. You know, maybe that's something that's uh, terrifying to them. Or um, there are people who are, you know, afraid of snakes, but not spiders. And, you know, why is that? So, you know, what are those innate fears? So everyone is built a little different, but there's very few innate fear circuits, meaning we're born with very few fears. And that's been very heavily studied. And the few that they have been described are considered kind of controversial in some way, whether you're really born with them. We can talk about that. But wh why I bring that up is that it means that most of our fears are learned. And I think about why are certain people scared of certain things? A lot of that is probably from learned behaviors. If you look at babies, you know, when something negative happens, a loud noise or whatever, the first thing they do is they look for mom and dad's expression. So if mom and dad are smiling, they're not scared, right? But if mom and dad's faces look scared, then they then amplifies in them. So actually learning, <laughs> developing that response. So people who might have, you know, fear of, you know, getting back to, you know, what experiences might scare certain people and others. I don't think there are people who are innately just never scared of anything. It's just finding what it is that they've learned to be <laughs> scared of. You mentioned haunted houses, amusement parks, roller coasters. Is that the same kind of phenomenon of like that momentary thrill and then you, you yeah. know, relieved when it's over? Yeah, I think they're similar. Um, the roller coaster is surprisingly similar. It's different in the sense that, well, it's similar in the sense that you have to s believe in your mind that you're in danger. Okay. I mean, if to really enjoy a roller coaster ride, you have to feel a little bit like there is danger. You shouldn't be moving this fast, you know? <laughs> and, and, and the same, when you go to a movie, you have to believe that it, you've gotten engrossed in the movie. You have to believe that you're somehow a little bit in danger or you're seeing something that's going to affect you, uh, in a negative way. So, the thing about an amusement park is that using, unlike a movie, right, they're using physical cues, right, to generate that fear, right? So if you go to the haunted house where the floor shifts, uh, you know, uh, they're giving your body physical cues, uh, the chainsaw, right, in the, in the haunted house, which is not, doesn't have a blade, but you, <laughs> you hear it. And, you know, that that gets to your most prehistoric aspects of your brain, that loud noise and and that that adds to the fear. So they're they're different in the sense that one provides all these physical, auditory, sensory experiences that 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 help kind of layer that fear in your brain, uh, you know, whereas a movie or a book you know, we have you, your, your, your brain has to decide that it wants to go into that scene. <laughs> you know, it has to, uh, if you, if you will yield to reality and go into that scene, right? Whereas an amusement park, you're being put into some physical scenario where it's driving, you're helping to drive some of that fear circuit. A lot of classic children's literature, Grimm's fairy tales, Pinocchio, that stuff can be really dark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, was that just back in those days, they were fairly insensitive to a kid's psychology? Was it that they thought they were more resilient? I think it's a great question, but I, I would I would say that our society has really evolved to try to eliminate negative stimuli just in general. So I don't know that if it's specific to kids. So if you, <laughs> you look back in the days when those stories were told, um, uh, you know, life was pretty dark. Uh, people didn't live long. Uh, they had horrible diseases. So I think reality was harsh. And it might be that, um, you know, maybe for those kids back then, that wasn't the most horrible thing. <laughs> that they experienced, right? And you think about the time, especially the times of uh, stories like Pinocchio when, you know, there were, you know, it was a pretty dark time. So I, I think that now that we, our society has evolved, I mean, think about now what we do even just for pain management, 
Like we're really not allowed to feel any pain. Right. <laughs> so I think our society is kind of just moved that way. And so we protect our, I think we insulate our kids in the same way. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing, honestly. Um, I think we, we don't give kids credit for their resilience to, um, you know, be able to experience and analyze difficult situations and learn from them. You know, I think we, they have to be exposed to that to develop properly. I, I but I, I'm guessing that, you know, if you live in a really challenging, dark time, a story like Pinocchio, isn't that scary? <laughs> yeah, I think there was an element, though, of they actually, these were uh, cautionary tales that they Definitely. wanted to scare kids from misbehaving. Absolutely. You're right. And uh, I mean, <laughs> a story from my father, you know, my my father, his roots are from Germany. And, uh, and, and I don't know, you know, exactly all of the heritage of this, but in, in certain parts of the Germanic culture, you know, Santa Claus was pretty scary. And, uh, so he would, <laughs> he would, um, when he was a kid growing up on a farm in, in North Dakota, the best thing you could hope for was that Santa wouldn't put, you know, coal in your shoes. And then Santa Claus would come up to the house with a big, uh, tractor chain and slam it against the house. And that's how you knew Santa Claus was <laughs> coming. <laughs> this was and when? It, this would have been in the, you know, 40s, you know, in wow. in North Dakota. But it was it this was a heritage they had brought from Germany right. and the Bosporus regions. Right. But it's just similar to what you're saying. I do think they were using this to make sure the kids would be good all year because not because Santa Claus would bring them something good, but because uh, you know, Santa would actually come and take the kids away and he would, you know, slam the yeah. chain and he could remove the kid. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's wild. Yeah. yeah. So without getting too sciencey, what happens in the brain when you're frightened? Sure. Well, it is complicated, but the, the simplest way to think about it is you have a, you know, there's a center in your brain, it's called the amygdala. And most people think this is the business end of, you know, your fear circuit. So, but the way fears are generated is that we well, have two, there's two basic ways to think about either a scare or a fear response, right? So there is, sub, and you mentioned before, there's unconscious or subconscious. So in the best example of that is a loud noise. So, um, you know, they call that acoustic startle. So when a loud noise occurs, um, that, and that's one of our innate circuit. So you're born with this. Um, and, and just like all fears, there has to be some sensory, some, uh, you know, sensory stimulus, and that can be movement that can be a sound in the case of the, of this auditory fear, a loud sound, if it's loud enough, um, it is directly connected. So the, the, from, from your ears, basically the nerves that come in from your ears go directly into the middle of the brain and activate the amygdala. And so the amygdala, when it's turned on, is making your brain secrete and all of your body a whole bunch of neurochemicals, okay? I mean, things that we know about adrenaline, right? So that's one of them for sure. But cortisol, which is a stress hormone, um, but a whole bunch of other factors in your brain, you know, choline, acetylcholine, which is an important a neurotransmitter for how your brain functions. So it's like a blast of all of these different uh, factors. And this makes your body have a tremendous physiological response. So you have your pupils dilate, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your body immediately mobilizes glucose, you know, sugar. So you have energy. Does your hair stand on your hair? Your hair, that's called pyloerection. And yes, the hair stands up. Um, that has to do with a particular part of the nervous system that's activated by the amygdala. So that's purposeful. All of those things are preparing you to do whatever you need to do at a heightened sense to avoid whatever danger it is. So you get that with a tone, loud tone, but you can also get it, the second way you get it with, is something that's more uh, of a learned behavior. And that's when you have, well, actually the, another, this is probably good to go to another example. So um, we know we're born with the fear of heights. Um, and there's some, as a test that was called the visual cliff. So they took these babies and they, they put them on a platform where they could fall off, but they couldn't. So they put a glass plate. So there's a ledge. And then they put a glass plate over that floor over the edge so that if a baby were to climb over the edge, they wouldn't fall. They would just stay on that glass platform. But it, they can see 
the edge. They can see the visual cliff. They can see that if they crawled over that, they would fall. And they sh they've shown that babies won't do it, right? They'll go to the edge and they'll look and they won't go. And that's an innate fear. So that's now another example. So that, that circuit is activated now by the visual system, right? So the visual system uh, of the baby is, is now creating another activating circuit. And it's in, and that one is hardwired in us when we're born. Um, but it's your, the baby, it's more complicated than the, uh, the tone, right? Because the baby has decided that the visual environment, they've interpreted the visual environment, that that's dangerous, that if they were to go over the edge, they would be hurt. So that is, it's a little more complicated, right? So there's vision and then the brain of the baby has to determine, has to put it in a context, and those two go together and activate the amygdala. And then you get the same responses that we just talked about. So you get that total activation and that uh, makes the baby not go over the edge, tells it this is seriously dangerous. So those are a couple examples of how the circuit works. Um, and it's mostly, again, people think of the amygdala as kind of the primary organizer of that. And then your brain so the cortex, your cerebral cortex, in particular, your front, your frontal cortex is always negotiating with the amygdala, right? So you're, you're interpreting your environment and, you know, just like we're talking about scary events like movies or roller coasters, your frontal cortex is deciding like, is this really dangerous? And then your amygdala is telling you, <laughs> yes, it's very dangerous. And the two are communicating and trying, you know, seeing who is going to determine whether you just relax through the whole thing or whether you're going to get this, you know, big fear response. Terrified of spiders? Afraid to fly? Have some other extreme fear? You're not alone. According to the American Psychiatric Association, phobias are the most common psychiatric illnesses among women and the second most common among men. The National Institute of Mental Health suggests phobias affect approximately 10% of U.S. adults. They typically emerge during childhood or adolescence and continue into adulthood. There are dozens of phobias. Most are classified into one of four categories. Animal, such as fear of snakes, spiders, or sharks. Environmental, such as confined places, deep water, or thunderstorms. Situational, such as visiting the dentist, public speaking, or flying. Bodily, such as blood, medical procedures, or choking. Of course, many of us have mild aversions that we refer to as phobias. To be diagnosed as a phobia, according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, a fear must be excessive, unreasonable, interfere with normal life, and have lasted for six months or more. Whether an actual disorder or hyperbole, the list of possible phobias keeps changing and growing. The first list, produced by a prominent physician in the 1700s, cited 18 culprits, including ghosts, known as phasmophobia. In the 1980s, people talked a lot about cauldrophobia, the fear of clowns, perhaps sparked by fiction like Stephen King's It. More recently, the term nomophobia was coined to describe the fear of being without a mobile device or beyond mobile phone contact. The unfortunate reality is that most people with phobias simply avoid the thing they fear rather than doing something about them. In fact, according to mental health officials, phobias are more responsive to treatment than other anxiety disorders. Is it unhealthy to be terrified? I don't, it, not brief. I mean, I think that generally we all acknowledge that's, it is how, almost healthy probably to occasionally be <laughs> scared because it serves a lot of good purposes so that you can think about that. In an entertainment sense or like if you were like at gunpoint, well, um, there, there's it didn't last yeah. too long. Yeah, absolutely. Even in that context or even just stepping off the curb, uh, going to the street and you get that, you know, that weird prickly on the back of your neck, you know, you're in danger and you hop out of the street. So that's a, that's useful fear. Right. And that, and that's scary too, because you, you avoid being killed. So this is a good, I guess, a good point to talk about. There's different kinds of fears. There's the fear that's useful. And then there's fear. There's something called like paralytic fear, or I think people even call it, um, like amygdala spasm, right? So it's like you, you can have the amygdala take over. So a good example of, appropriate fear would be you, you, you're headed down an alley 
and there's a, and your brain decides there's a couple of people there that you don't want to encounter. You don't know why, right? But your intuition tells you not to go there. And so that's good fear because you turn around and you just exit the alley. Okay. That's functional fear, right? And that's useful. And I mentioned, you know, stepping off into the street, but something tells you, you have a sensation that you shouldn't be in the street and you avoid an accident. Now the bad, the paralytic fear is when maybe you are held up <laughs> at gunpoint and you're so terrified that you're going to die. You can't, you no longer, Migdal is working so hard that you can't think straight anymore. You can't, you don't know your name. Uh, you, you may not even know where your wallet is. You, you know, you become paralyzed and that's a paralytic fear, um, where it, you know, they call that freezing and that can be obviously dysfunctional. That can actually get you into, into trouble, right? If there's a predator after you and you, you actually go into this sort of paralytic fear, this overactivation of the amygdala, then you're going to get eaten, <laughs> right? So, so there's, there's functional and dysfunctional fear. And you asked me whether it's bad for you. And I would say neither of those fears are probably bad for you other than unless you get eaten, right? That's bad. <laughs> if it has a bad consequence because they're short term and your body's designed to handle all of these transmitters and, you know, growth factors and whatever, all these things that are released, all these factors that are released, your body's able to handle those in short doses and short, short amounts. That's, that's fine. That's healthy. But if it was more prolonged, it would be a problem. Haven't they done studies with animals that they're in a constant state of yeah. fear? Yeah. Con constant stress. And they call that uncontrolled stress. So, you know, you, they'd model that in animals. Um, you can, you know, you have two animals next to each other and you have one control when the feeding and watering happens and that creates stress in the other animal. So uh, what called uncontrolled stress, chronic uncontrolled stress is very bad, right? You can think of that as you know, maybe let's go back to like, maybe you think you're going to get fired. So you're having a problem at work and you're going to think you're going to get fired. So you can also have uncontrolled long-term stress over that and it, and it can breed inaction, right? Because you're terrified of facing uh, this problem, right? You, your fear of getting fired actually paralyzes you, but it causes a physiological stress, which is bad. And it actually can make the problem worse, right? Because you can fear the problem and it, it creates inaction, right? The greatest, you know, relief from uncontrolled fear like that is action, right? So not thinking, <laughs> overthinking is what uh, gets us into trouble with this chronic fear. And then that can turn into uh, generalized anxiety disorders. Um, people who over perseverate on things that they're afraid of, especially things that are kind of future things, right? Things that they may or may not have control over, um, that can lead to anxiety, right? That, that is damaging for your brain permanently, can be permanently damaging. Yeah. Back to temporary scares. One, one trope in the movies is scaring someone to death because they have an existing heart condition. Does that happen? Can that happen? I think that's probably very rare. This is not my expertise, but, you know, heart attacks, for example, happen in some of the weirdest times. They're rare, you know, usually at when people are sleeping or just waking up, you know, they, they rarely are when we're at, you know, really, um, uh, you know, actively engaged <laughs> as much. So I don't, I don't know the statistics on whether or not fear would get cause a heart attack. I'm guessing that it, again, if you're, if you're doing fear for entertainment, probably not, <laughs> It's probably even healthy, maybe. But if you have a very stressful event, uh, more like we described, you know, like, you know, being robbed or something like that, that could be because remember, again, once you overstimulate that circuit, you're you really are pressing hard on the cardiovascular system. And so maybe that could be dangerous. Can you talk about the evolutionary aspect of fear? You know, why kids and even adults in some situations are, are afraid of the dark, even yeah. not just a dark alley where you who yeah. knows, but the dark right. generally. So, okay. So animals, I think it's, I think this is a great question because, um, I think that humans are probably uniquely afraid of the dark, right? So, and other fears. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second, but I think that the animals are, have very purposeful, so evolutionary 
you know, beneficial fears, right? So we study rodents in our lab, for example, and rodents are afraid of a rapidly expanding shadow. So, you know, if they're walking in the meadow in a rapidly expanding shadow, they will scurry, you know, if it's rapidly expanding around them because they think that's probably some predator flying down to swoop and get them. Okay. Then they don't need to learn that. That's somehow wired in them when they're, when they're born, right? There are, you know, a lot of animals that are actually afraid of sharp objects. Somehow they know that sharp is bad. Like they can just, they can visualize that. Um, there's a lot of innate fears that are beneficial, right, for our survival. And they make sense evolutionarily. It just, you know, if you learn to fear, uh, you know, fire ants because of their color and so forth, and then that became a good fear and it was built in, right? So, now humans have this, you know, we have this huge cortex <laughs> and, uh, you know, just like all the creative minds that created these scary movies for us and uh, scary books and the amusement parks and all that, that creativity allows us to imagine and generate fears, right? Because we're creative. So if you're the dark, again, I, I would go back to fear of the dark is <laughs> something that's taught. So kids learn that. From some of the, you know, cartoons and stories they read with, right? Because everything bad is in the dark, you know, and fairy tales and so forth. So kids, I think, can be desensitized to that, obviously, and the parents can play a role in that. But, you know, they're, they're yeah, that's, that's, if it is still a learned fear. I don't think we're born, I think it's controversial anyway. I don't think we're born with the fear of the dark. Humans have developed a fear of the unknown. And we, when we don't know what something is, the dark. So if you're going to a dark room, your brain has the ability to fill it in with some horrible things. But that's, I think, uniquely human, that ability. What are the different kinds of fear? Uh, I, I think of sudden shock. I think of a buildup that I think of as dread. I don't know if that's the yeah. right word. Are, are there others? Are those the, sort of the main ones? Yeah. Well, definitely. So you mentioned the sudden shock, which is quick and over, right? So meaning... Uh, I don't know, somebody opens the door quickly. And so your first instinct might be that could be an intruder or something scary, right? So you, and then as soon as you see it's your, your family or whatever, uh, then you feel this relief, right? So that's sudden, um, you know, you, we mentioned loud noises and so forth. You mentioned dread. And I think dread is a really interesting one because it can be kind of good and bad, right? I think, you know, there's something about, I think people, you know, for people who do like bungee jumping or something like that, it's got to be part of the whole experience is the dread, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> the buildup. Now, again, knowing that they're not going to die, most likely, allows them to weather that dread. And there's something powerful about the release of that, right? That's that I, I should say that must feel good, right? I've never done that, but I assume that must feel good. Um, that because that's controlled dread. You did it, you know, that's you did it yourself. You manufactured it. Um, dread, which is, I guess, really, I think a word like anxiety, right? Dread is you are anticipating something that's a bad, that's about to happen. Let's say you, you know, you have to get a shot or whatever. So you have to go get the shot. So you're dreading that and sort of pathological dread is when you can't control that right? And you actually, you developed so much of this fear cycle and affects you so much that you don't even face what it is you, you need to face, right? So that's a negative aspect against of, the, of this fear circuit, overactivation of this fear circuit. So one thing I mentioned about that dread, they've done studies where, you know, it, you can, you can, it's very easy to affect the psychology of someone anticipating something, right? And you can, you can look at how they react to something just by presenting, <laughs> you know, let's go back to the shot. So if you, if a patient knows, you know, the doctor said, this isn't going to hurt at all. I've been doing this all day. It doesn't hurt. There's a very, their dread is diminished, but if the doctor says, eh, you're probably going to want to take a couple of days off. This one hurts. Okay. So there's this, there is a psychology to it as well. Um, whether, you know, you have a healthy or unhealthy anticipation and how, and that, how that works. So there's a variety of other, you know, types of fear. Um, there is a pathology that is really, some people have fear and they don't know what it is. They're gen, just have a general fear. Um, and that is kind of a fear of, they, you know, they know something negative is going to happen, 
but they don't know what, okay. This is the fear of fear in some way. <laughs> so, um, and that is typically probably considered abnormal, right. And, and, and maybe, uh, you know, a, a symptom of, um, their brain chemistry is, is changed a bit for, for one reason or another, and, and maybe needs to be treated. You've mentioned uh, some studies. Is this a very studied area? I mean, are there classic fear studies? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a big area of medicine. You know, anxiety is a big problem in, in modern society. Um, so the, the classic way that uh, scientists have studied fear in animals is they do something called fear conditioning. We mentioned the visual cliff test. That's another one we do in animals too, or uh, scientists use in animals. Fear conditioning is where you, you take an animal and you present it with a noxious stimulus, um, you know, maybe to shock the foot or something like that. And then you pair it with uh, some other uh, non-noxious stimulus, like a sound, a tone or a light or something like that. So you do that a few times and the animal associates that tone with a negative uh, stimulus. So then you look at those animals and see if you take away the noxious stimulus and just present the tone, for example, how long does it take for the animal to um, recognize that tone is not dangerous anymore? It's not. How, does it, how long does it take to dissociate <laughs> the tone from the noxious stimulus? And so that's one of the ways that we've studied fear circuits, right, is by watching the extinction of that and seeing how the brain changes when you lose that the treatment for anxiety, which is a big, as I mentioned, is a big problem. I'm sure there's pharmacological treatments, but one of the treatments for a variety of anxieties or fear is this deconditioning or conditioning without the noxious stimulus. So you get exposed to what it is you're afraid of, but without the, the perceive, what you perceive as dangerous. <laughs> so you kind of get exposed to it. And what that, what's that, what that is doing in your brain again, is it's giving your frontal lobe more control. Your frontal lobe is able to retrain that circuit and kind of tell the amygdala that this isn't going to be dangerous. So I don't need to activate the the amygdala, right? That's kind of what, uh, what fear conditioning that whole study is, is, is teaching us about the brain that you can do that. So you don't need to pharmacologically do that. Many people, you can desensitize them. And actually a good, a good analogy of this is like fear junkies, right? So people who love, you know, extreme <laughs> experiences, they're never satisfied. And why are they never satisfied? Right? So they might start with, I don't know, they might start with something that's not that scary, maybe just jumping off a high dive, right? And then it just gets progressive, right? And that is your brain is learning, you know, and deconditioning on this stimulus. You're learning that you're safe and your brain needs more and more sense of danger to get the amygdala activated. And they're, they're, you know, driven by that. So they have the opposite problem. You know, some people, well, I don't want to get too technical, but I think, you know, they're, they're, there's a gas and a break in your brain for the circuit, right? And so in some people, there might be a little too much of the, accelerator just sort of on normally in this circuit. And so for those people, the ability to develop hypersensitivity to scary situations is just more common. And then you go to the fear junkies, they have the opposite problem. They crave it and they, they condition quite quickly and they have to then, you know, skydive and, you know, more and more, you know, free base jumping or whatever. They have to have more and more of the experience to get the, the pleasure aspect of it. How about human studies? I don't know if the, how ethical those would be, but have they done anything with someone in high states of anxiety where yeah. they've done brain imaging or skin tests or anything like yeah. that? Yeah, they do a lot of the a lot of brain imaging. Um, there's a lot of anxiety studies in brain imaging. Uh, you know, using um, what we call functional MRI. What that's doing is it's looking at the best description would be looking at activity of different parts of your brain, and then they can they put you in the scan and um, expose you to different scary scenarios, um, you know, pictures essentially, or sounds, and then they look at how your brain reacts to that. But in those studies, um, they've shown again that, that people who have a hype, a hyper sensitivity to different fear stimuli um, usually have a increase in this, again, accelerator 
right? This thing that activates the circuitry going to the amygdala, that they have an increase in, in that activity. And there, there are people have confirmed this in study in animal studies too. Like if you inject this accelerator right into the amygdala of a, a mouse, you can make it become fearful of very ordinary things, right? So it becomes, so I guess it'd be good to talk about this, you know, one of the problems with fear is when it becomes too generalized. I talked about people who may have just fear of the unknown, like they just know something, impending doom. And I think you called it dread, but impending doom, <laughs> another way to think about it. So in patients, um, what they've described with imaging is that there are sometimes people um, have a, if you will, a dissociated fear circuit meaning it gets activated by many different things. So it, it's not that they have really controlled uh, very specific fear stimuli. And that is, again, it's this overactivation, it's over this accelerator is being on. And so that they kind of generalize fear. And that's where it can be very um, debilitating for these people, right? So, and that's been shown in imaging um, that there's very little difference between something that should be not very scary, but, um, compared to the actual scary stimulus, it's, that's the, 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 um, response in their brain is not very dissimilar. That can be very, again, that can be very debilitating. One of science's most illuminating windows into fear involves a woman who doesn't suffer from it. The woman, identified by researchers as just SM, suffers from a rare genetic condition called erbach weith disease, which caused parts of her brain to harden and waste away. Over time, that damage completely destroyed her amygdala, the part of the brain involved in processing emotion, particularly fear. As a result, SM doesn't feel it. According to a story in Discover Magazine, she's been held at knife point without the slightest tinge of panic, she'll happily handle live snakes and spiders even though she says she hates both, and she can sit through a lengthy assortment of scary film clips without a single flinch. That wasn't always the case. She remembers being afraid of the dark as a young child, running away screaming when her older brother jumped out from behind a tree. She says the time she was pinned to a corner by a large Doberman in adolescence was gut-wrenching. But those events happened before her disease destroyed her amygdala. During her adult life, neither she nor researchers can pinpoint a single moment where she clearly experienced fear. The wild thing is, in other ways, her mental abilities are normal. Her IQ, her memory, her language, and perception skills. She also understands the concept of fear. She knows, for instance, that other people might be scared by the film she saw, but she herself has problems detecting danger. To those of us wishing we could overcome our fears, SM's fearlessness might seem like a great thing. But it's no such thing. Researchers note that her behavior frequently exposes her to real-life situations she should avoid. A vivid illustration of how the amygdala promotes survival by warning us to stay away from danger. What do we know about nightmares? Why, why does a horror movie that seemed kind of harmless at the time cause a nightmare later on? Yeah, good question. Um, I can only speculate. I mean, I don't think we know, uh, but we know that... Um, when you're dreaming, your brain is basically cycling electrical activity through basically all of the neurons in your brain at different frequencies. So different, uh, you know, alpha waves and theta waves, different frequency of neuronal firing. And it's passing through all your circuits in the brain. So when you have a memory of anything, when you experience anything, I should say, it creates a trace uh, in your brain, which is in, you know, it's stored in multiple areas of your brain and I, and context is really important. So for memory, so, um, you know, if you experience something like, I don't know, I don't know if you remember the, you know, the color of the shirt of the person you wrote up in the elevator today, do you remember? Probably okay. not. Right. Yeah. So, but if that person screamed at you, you'd probably remember the color of their shirt. So when you have a scary stimulus when you experience a horror movie you get the magic combination of something you know a unique experience but you've got the physiological you know uh circuit 
activated there, which drives that a little bit deeper into these traces in your brain. So this like trace, this sort of outline of that event is now in your brain. So when you're, when you're dreaming, when you're in this, you know, REM, you know, sleep and you're actively dreaming, what's happening is these random cycles, high frequency electrical activity, just cycling through your brain. And every once in a while, it's going to activate one of these traces and it plays in that trace. That's the best explanation that I can think of for dreaming. And that's what's happening in your brain. You're suddenly, Oh, now you're, you're being chased by the, by the guy from the horror movie with a knife and your brain just plays with that. But you know, of course your brain will also combine that. You might be eating spaghetti and doing something else, right? While you're in that scenario. But, um, so it has to be, you know, most of the time, I think our, you know, our brain is at play when we're, it's, when we're sleeping, um, it's actually doing some really important physiological things too, when it's dreaming, but, um, but really it's a very random, uh, kind of visitation of these trace experiences and they can go back to childhood. You never know what's going to get recalled. So, you know, you, you, you know, you know, as a human and you dream, you never know. <laughs> what, how these experiences are going to be combined. So I think it's, again, it's the strength of the stimulus. So if you had a, a very scary experience at the haunted house that might go into your dreams, might get incorporated into your dreams because it's a little more of a, uh, very strong trace memory in, in your brain. You touched on this a little before, but I want to dive a little bit more into our fear of everyday non-deadly things. Yeah. Public speaking, a yeah. test. <laughs> Is that the same phenomenon that's going on and with acute fear, just more subtle? Yeah. It's it, it and for some people it's it's paralyzing. I think public speaking is a great one, you know. It's a great one to talk about because it is, they say it's the number one fear of, you know, people is public speaking. I don't know if that's still the case. I would have thought it would be some other things, but, uh, but public speaking is very scary. So it is the same, it's the same circuit and, but your but okay. We, we talked about like where the amygdala can interpret your environment. So if, uh, you know, if you see a tiger bearing down on your, your amygdala doesn't have to wait for your cortex, right? Your amygdala knows <laughs> that that is bad and, and, and it processes it quickly. Public speaking is again, it's somehow your, your prefrontal cortex, your thinking brain has decided that something really horrible can happen to you public speaking. Okay. And that's embarrassment, uh, you know, ruin your reputation, whatever. Uh, you know, you say something stupid and, or, you know, be labeled as an idiot. You know, there's all these, the, your, but your brain is generating all of those, uh, you know, de novo and then sending it to the amygdala and the amygdala is, you know, creating this, um, uh, everything we just said, your pupils are dilating, you're sweating, your, you know, heart rate is up. And unfortunately, when it gets a little bit, and, and I can't imagine anybody, probably all of us experience this, when we've, you know, had to do a public speaking, if you feel that fear, once it's there, it becomes paralytic. You can't answer questions properly. You don't remember exactly what you intended to say. And so it is very similar, right, the, to... Uh, you know, I think the fear circuit in general, you, you can think about it as just, it's a very, you know, evolutionarily old circuit in our brain. It's in the, you know, in our midbrain, it's an early, early structure and it just, it kind of is on or off and it, it serves, you know, a very, I think, um, almost binary purpose. It isn't very subtle. <laughs> so, so fear of speaking can be as powerfully, fear inducing as a guy running at you with, you know, a blade, I think. So I mentioned an exam because I remember using that with my college roommate. Yeah. I saw a distinct memory of this in yeah. which he had the hiccups. Yeah. And he had been going on for a little while. And I suddenly thought, well, let's try scaring him. So I mentioned a class that we had together. I noticed he came in late the other day. Did you, did you hear her? Did you have a chance to hear him mentioning that we have a quiz coming up this week? Lost his hiccups. <laughs> so it, what's the connection? We, that's not one of the manifestations of yeah. fear we talked about. What's the connection between spasms coming up from the diaphragm and, yeah. and fear? We basically touched on the answer. So if you have, if you have that spasm going on, when you hit the amygdala and you turn on all of those physiologic responses, one of the big things you do is you completely dilate your respiratory system and you shut down your GI system, right? Cause you don't need to be 
processing your lunch, right? So you turn that off and you, you open all your air passages. So there, you know, you, you've completely reversed, you know, this spasm that's going on in, you know, in, in that system and you're dilating everything. So that's how it works. Even though it's just brief, you just shut off that, that, that circuit. How about sort of the classic psychological fears that hold people back? Fear of abandonment, fear of success or failure, intimacy, same thing still? Yeah, I think they are. I think that they are more chronic, though. That's the chronic fear, right? So we think of fear of abandonment. That's not usually second to second, although it can be, I suppose. But typically we think of, yeah, that's a future problem for me. And um, so that's it's not quite the same. You don't get the quite, you know, the full fight or flight response. You get more of a, like a low grade anxiety that is, you know, is neg negative. So you get the, you know, you don't get the big epinephrine, you don't get the adrenaline, I should say as much, but you get a lot of the, like the cortisol, right? These stress uh, features, uh, which are bad, right? So it's a little, it's a little bit different. It's like a little less of the balance than we think of true fear. Uh, but yeah, fear, you know, anticipatory fear of something as abstract as it being abandoned, et cetera, is, is very, it's using the same circuit. Uh, it's activating the same circuit, um, but it's turning it on in a different way, more in a chronic way. And let's come back to what you mentioned earlier on about um, learn fears versus innate ones. Yeah. Babies don't have any sort of fear. So the only fears that are documented is this fear of heights, right? And then if you really want to call it a fear, but there is loud noises, right? So there's acoustic, acoustic stimuli. It, that's pretty much it. Um, it's been really well studied that babies in general, again, look to their parents for what to be afraid of. Okay. So lastly, do you have a favorite scary movie? Well, I like I like The Shining. I mean, I, I like it because there's a lot of uh, sort of unknown fear in there. It's produ that's produced a lot of anxiety and anticipatory fear in there, and I like I like that that story a lot. So that that's definitely one of my favorites. Do you make a point to watch it around Halloween season? I like to. Time? Yeah, I, I enjoy doing that. And I went I got to visit the Stanley Hotel um, with my daughter, where he. Um, imagine that story where he, where he, he, at least he developed the idea for writing the book. Uh, and it's quite an interesting thing to read a little bit about how he conceived of it. And so that, that's part of it. I think now I, knowing a little more of the writers, you know, how he, how he, um, he drew from his own childhood and some of his own childhood experiences and fears makes it even a deeper experience for me and, and why I really like that movie. All right. Very good. I think that wraps it up for me. I've really enjoyed this discussion. I don't know about you, but uh, these scary things have kind of always fascinated me. Yeah, I love this topic. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not a fear junkie, but I think like, like so many of us, I love being scared occasionally. It's just, it is a great distraction. And I, and I love uh, the feeling afterwards, right? So I love this discussion. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. So takeaways, guys. I think my takeaway was, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't talk about this at the beginning beyond my fear of the dark. I'm afraid of a lot of things and I don't really like scary movies. Okay. Um, this imagination can take my brain places without, you know, something scary. Um, it was funny to me though, when you, when you guys were talking about the different sort of fears, fear of public speaking being like one of the most prominent, that's like the one thing that's never been scary to me. I don't know why, but I found that funny because I'm scared of almost everything else. So you're just a natural talker. I wouldn't normally think that about myself, but I guess maybe that's the case. But it just, it was interesting to me that the things that I'm worried about are very like life and death. Uh, maybe not so much like what other people think about me and stuff. And so like when I'm more talking about horror movies, like, yeah, I am worried that someone could be in my house hiding behind the shower curtain when I walk <laughs> in to go to the bathroom at 2 a.m. So I just thought that was kind of funny. But you, you know, these movies are make believe, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of them are based on true stories, Todd. <laughs> well, those, those are the scarier ones. Like horror movies for me, I'm not too frightened of all this over the top violence and stuff and supernatural killers, but it's like the, the real world stuff, like Halloween, right? Like that series, right? That's, that's like a Michael Myers becomes supernatural at some point, but when it starts out, it's just a guy and you don't understand what he's doing, what he's doing. And it's kind of low scale, but people are hiding in shadows and it's more like suspense and thriller. And that, that's the kind of horror that I respond to to kind of, kind of, ropes me in but you enjoy it yeah okay yeah 
Texas Chainsaw Massacre was one based on a, a real incident. Which which sounds absurd. Like you hear that title, like yeah. ridiculous title of this, but you're right. It's based based off true events. Yeah. So So I'm the only one afraid of scary movies. Is that what we're is that the consensus here? Mm, I would say it kind of depends. I find myself I can watch documentaries about crime, um, but I think probably much like Dr. Horner said, I have watched a movie by myself kind of late at night and it was the film uh, Zodiac Mm. and which it was a, you know, theatrical release, but it was based on a true story and I should not have done that because I was very scared I can admit this was probably when I was in my mid to late 20s and I was a grown woman who called her father in the middle of the (laughs) night to just and all I did was say, you know, I'm scared. I just want to chit chat for a little bit. You and didn't say it's all your fault because you exposed me to these. <laughs> you scarred me. Like started me down a path yeah. where I like to scare myself. Um, no, I, I think I don't know what we talked about, um, but no, yeah, I, just like, I, I just called and I was like, I'm scared. I want to chit chat for a little bit to calm myself down. And did and, it help just kind of like chatting about something else, taking your mind off of it? Because another thing he mentioned is that horror can kind of take your mind off stressors where it's like, mm. I I was like, I feel like I need something to take my mind off of this like scary <laughs> movie that I just watched. So I agree with you. I would need to like call someone like nowadays, like get on FaceTime with someone and be like, come check the whole house with me. Join me in this this dangerous environment that I put myself in. No, I feel that my my wife doesn't like scary movies or horror movies, but she'll watch some. But it has to be like in the daytime. Yeah, it's critical like, if you don't like them. Okay, because we started watching uh, Midnight Mass, which is a limited series on Netflix from a couple of years ago. And we started watching it at night, and we really liked it. But she was like, "Okay, <laughs> for the we got if we're gonna finish the show, we got to start watching it during the day." <laughs> so it's just not quite the same vibe, right? Because there's something about sitting around a campfire and telling a scary story, right? When we talked about that sort of you know, back your, back your mind, fear stuff and what your imagination can conjure up. What's, what's beyond the firelight and that kind of stuff. Yeah. When it's like two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm like, I don't think a vampire is going to pop out and get me. Right. So you like the vibe. You like to even make the scary movie spooky. It's but immersive, Okay. Know? Yeah. Part of the experience. I'm like, I'm like your wife. I need to watch stuff in broad. When I do watch scary stuff and what I consider scary, I need to watch in broad daylight. I need to do something else for several hours before going to sleep. <laughs> um, like I loved Dexter. But I had to watch episodes in very small amounts and then in broad daylight and like go do something after to get my mind off of it. I just, I don't know. It's so interesting. I I mean, I liked how much you guys talked about like kind of my side of it where it's like people who the reason people like horror, but then why people don't like it because I'm the antithesis of all of that. Yeah, I think he said that uh, people like you, this it's too real and. It causes actual anxiety. Is this true, like for any kind of horror, as opposed to like the, the slasher subgenre? You know, I was thinking about that while y'all, while y'all were talking. I think any kind of horror puts my brain on track for just scary. You know what I mean? Like, I think at this point, I've conditioned myself to like associate horror with just me going into this anxious, scared state. Because like there are like the jump scare stuff. Like I don't know if that stuff actually scares me. Like I'm not a jump scare person, but then I can be like, "Ooh, I know I watched something spooky." So now I'm in my head about it. Do you like theme park rides? Um, different different reason I don't like those. Uh, what do you like? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, we identified that I have a lot of fears. So haunted houses. I would absolutely no, never go to haunted house. No that way, sounds, you would not. Yeah, make that it sounds out. like the worst thing anybody could possibly invite <laughs> me to. Going back to public speaking or, or, or riffing off that, I still have nightmares about tests coming up in school that I haven't studied for. I, I, have I didn't too, go to yeah. class all all semester. Yeah, and I'm having to cram right before the night before for the. Yeah, I think final. I had a dream. I I um, failed a math test last week, yeah. so that was fun. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, no, I, I don't know that for whatever reason that doesn't, you know, those apparently actual real things. Don't scare me. <laughs> it's just the weird someone's hiding in my shower. No one's ever in my shower. <laughs> but you got to look. You got to look. Yeah. yeah. That's going to do it for this episode of On Health with Houston Methodist. Share, like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We drop new episodes every Tuesday morning. And until then, stay tuned. Stay healthy.